Hey class, in this recording we're going to focus on the heart, specifically the anatomy of the heart. So let's dive into it. As we look at our heart, it is part of the cardiovascular system. And we talked about this last chapter, but just to review and refresh, cardiovascular system, cardio meaning heart, vascular meaning blood vessels, so it's the heart and blood vessels. And that is distinct from the circulatory system, which is going to have the heart, blood vessels, and the blood. Now, as we look at our cardiovascular system, there are some pretty major divisions of our cardiovascular system. The two biggies are the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit. And as we look at these two circuits or divisions, the pulmonary circuit is going to be primarily on the right side of the heart, and it depends on how you, you look at it. Um, we are going to have a patient-centered point of view, and from our patient-centered point of view, it's the right side of the heart, right atrium, right ventricle. And it's going to carry blood from the body that's deoxygenated, and then send that blood to the lungs to be reoxygenated. And then the systemic circuit is on the left side of the heart. It carries oxygenated blood from the lungs and then sends that oxygenated blood back to the rest of the body. Now, this figure can be a little bit misleading. Um, a common, well, I shouldn't say common, but a fairly frequent misconception I see from students is they'll see the they'll think that all of the deoxygenated blood goes to one lung and then only oxygenated blood leaves the other lung. That is incorrect. Um, so I just want to be very clear. Each lung, each separate lung receives deoxygenated blood and each separate lung, the left and right lung, will send oxygenated blood away. Now, as we're looking at the left side of the heart, that left side of the heart is going to receive fully oxygenated blood from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. And we haven't spent a lot of time talking about blood vessels yet, but I just need to emphasize here, veins always, always, by definition, head towards the heart. And by definition, arteries go away from the heart. So the vein, this vein right here, because it's a vein, it's heading towards the heart. And then we look at this palm for a lung. The pulmonary vein is coming from the lungs. The pulmonary artery heads to the lungs. So as we're looking at the right side of the heart, we're going to have oxygen poor blood arrive at the heart, or deoxygenated blood, as I like to say it, arriving from the vena cave, the vena cava. So we have the superior vena cava, you know, the one coming from the top, and then the inferior vena cava, the one coming from the bottom. And that is how we get blood to the heart. Now, as we're looking at our heart, it's going to be located in the mediastinum cavity. And this is a common stickler for students. A lot of students, uh, you may remember this back in Bio 214, when we talked about body cavities and the serosa, the double membranes around the body cavities. We, we talked about the heart. Many students, myself included, I used to believe this as well, just assumed the pericardial cavity is the one that the, completely contained the heart. The heart is in, wrapped around... The, the pericardial cavity wraps around most of the heart, but the entire heart is going to be in this mediastinum cavity. And as we're looking at the heart, there's the pointy end. The pointy end, and I'm coloring it green right here, making a nice point, is called the apex. We also have apexes of lungs, apexes of adrenal glands, just the apex in human anatomy is a generic term that refers to the pointy end of an organ. So the apex of the heart is this little point down here, and then the base is the flattened portion. So on the heart, the base is on the superior margin of the heart, whereas with the lungs, the base is on the inferior margin. And as we look at the heart, you know, a good rule of thumb is that the heart is about the size of your fist. So when you're looking at a little kid and they make a fist, ah, that's about the size of their heart. Um, bigger people tend to have bigger fists, and they need bigger hearts. Um, so that's a good reference point in terms of finding the size of that pump in the body. Um, to give you an idea, some numbers, you know, generally speaking, we're talking about a quote unquote average adult. We're looking at about 10 ounces or about two thirds of a pound for the overall mass of the heart. Now, the heart is contained within the mediastinum cavity, but it's enclosed or has wrapped around it the pericardium. 
And that pericardium is that double-walled membrane. It's one of the serous membranes. And as we look at this pericardium, it's one continuous membrane that wraps around the heart. And it folds back on itself. And there's a little bit of space, that little tiny bit of space between those double membranes is the pericardial cavity. So the pericardial cavity goes around the heart. It does not contain the heart. And that's why we make that distinction. Um, this is a classic figure here. If you take a fist and jam it into a balloon, the balloon would fold back on itself, just like the serous membrane does. This pericardium is really important because it gives the heart a little bit of room to expand and move. And within this pericardial cavity, we have a bunch of highly slippery fluid, pericardial fluid, that's very um, low friction. It reduces friction and reduces abrasion on the outside of the heart as the heart is pumping and moving around. There are two layers to this membrane. We have the layer against the cavity wall and the layer against the organ itself. And remember back um, to last semester, when we're talking about visceral stuff, we're talking about organ base. So the visceral pericardium is the layer that presses directly against the surface of the heart. And in this instance, for this particular organ, it's also known as the epicardium. The surface membrane of the heart is the inner serous membrane. And then we also have the parietal pericardium. This is the outer layer of the pericardial membrane, sometimes just referred to as the pericardial sac. It, and it's, if you ever do a heart dissection, this is a very obvious membrane. It's very conspicuous. And occasionally, we find that people have inflammation buildup, uh, inflammation of the pericardium or those membranes around the heart. That is referred to as pericarditis. And this particular condition is excessively painful because it's not like you can ever stop moving your heart to help the inflammation go down. Um, it tends to have a lot of positive feedback loops associated with it. Now, as we're looking at the three layers of the heart, we first talked about the surface membranes. Let's talk about the wall of the heart. We can take the wall and break it up into three layers. We have the epicardium, which is on the surface of the heart. And we just talked about it on the last slide. It's also known as the visceral pericardium. And every once in a while, um, we'll find, particularly if we're working with individuals that are overweight, carrying a lot of excess weight in their bodies, that they'll have some adipose build up at that epicardial layer. We also find that there's a lot of blood vessels that supply nutrients to the heart tissue, that myocardium itself. And those blood vessels are going to be moving around within the epicardium. We also are going to have an endocardium. And this, as this root word endo implies, if epi is on the surface or above, endo is going to be inside. And it's going to be this innermost layer of the heart. And this endocardium is very slippery and is going to be continuous. It's a simple, um, excuse me, What's the word I'm looking for? Simple squamous. There we go. It's a simple squamous layer of tissue that's incredibly slippery and that is continuous with the inner lining of the blood vessels so that we have um, wherever there's blood moving, it's exposed to this very slippery surface. It also is going to cover the surfaces of the valves of the heart, like this left AV valve that I'm just highlighting right over here so that those valves are less likely to have blood, blood stick to them as well. We don't want blood sticking to the structures inside of the heart because that promotes coagulation and you definitely don't want the heart to be filled with a giant blood clot. That, tend to be, that tends to be bad for patient outcomes. And then there's the, the beef, so to speak, the meaty layer of the heart, the myocardium. Myo meat is a, a prefix that we talked about last semester, myo meaning muscle, the myocardium is the layer of cardiac muscle tissue that's in between, sandwiched between the epicardium and the endocardium. And as we look at this myocardium, it tends to spiral. And you really can't see the spiral when you're looking at the heart from the outside. But if you were to look at the apex of the heart, and typically what, to see the spiral, you take the apex of the heart and then you just slice off just the tip of the apex of the heart, and you can get a view that looks like this. So you can see that spiraling of the cardiomyocytes. So in that spiral it's, um, causes the heart to twist as it contracts. It's just like wringing water out of a dish rag after you, um, right before you wipe down a countertop. It really just squeezes all the possible blood out of the heart.
uh, when it contracts. And as we're looking at our heart, our heart also has a fibrous skeleton. This fibrous skeleton is going to be made of a lot of collagen and elastic fibers. And here's a, a figure highlighting some of that fibrous skeleton for us. And these, fi these um, collagen and elastic fibers are the the girders, the grid work, the framework of the heart that the cardiomyocytes attach to, these are going to provide the anchor points or the other structures of the heart. And this fibroskeleton also is going to give us electrical insulation. We want the atria and the ventricles to be separated from each other, um, electrically speaking. So here we have ventricles on the bottom of the screen that I'm circling in green right now. And these ventricles are going to contract at the same time. But then above those ventricles, right here where I'm making this big green oval, there, there should be atria. And we, when the atria are contracting and having electricity travel through them, we don't want electricity traveling through the ventricles. We want one the atria to contract and then the ventricles to contract. So this fibrous skeleton helps to coordinate the contraction of the heart so that we can have efficient pumping of blood. Now, as we look at the chamber of the heart, we have four chambers total. Atria are superior, ventricles are inferior, and we have also are going to have left and right terminology. And again, remember, patient-centered points of view are used when we use left and right terminology. So as we're looking at them, we have the left atria and the right atria. Here is our left atria. It receives oxygenated blood from the lungs. Here is the right atria. It receives deoxygenated blood from the bodies, body. And then on these atria, there are some small extensions that um, are kind of like overflow chambers, and they were referred to as oracles. And the reason they're called oracles is because early anatomists thought they looked like ear flaps. And let me shift colors here. I'm going to go to uh, yellow. So here is one oracle associated with the right atria. And then here's the other oracle right over there associated with our left atria. And we also are going to have the ventricles. Those are the inferior chambers and the biggest chambers. They are going to pump blood away from the heart. Atria receive, ventricles send the blood away. And as we're looking at those chambers, the... The right, oh, I need to go back to green here. The right ventricle is going to send blood to the lungs, the pulmonary circuit. And since the lungs aren't that big compared to the rest of our body, um, the left ventricle, or excuse me, the right ventricle doesn't need to have a very thick myocardium. So if we look at that myocardial layer, it's very thin right there for the right ventricle. The left ventricle, on the other hand, sends blood to the rest of the body, to the systemic circuit. So it's going to have a very thick layer of myocardium around it. So it can pump blood through many, many, many more miles of blood vessels. Excuse me. So if we look at this cross-sectional slice here, you can see how the left ventricle is surrounded by a th very thick layer of myocardium, allowing it to work harder. Now, as we're looking at these chambers of the heart, we're also going to have some sulci. And the sulci, if you remember from the nervous system, a sulcus in the brain is just a shallow groove or indentation. So we're going to have some shallow grooves or indentations in the heart. We have the atrioventricular sulcus. Atrioventricular is a fantastic name. I love it because it tells you exactly where it's going to be. It's going to be a small, shallow indentation that helps to separate the atria from our ventricles. And we also are going to have an interventricular sulcus. And when we look at this interventricular sulcus, inter means in between. What's it in between? It's in between the ventricles. And that interventricular sulcus is very clearly visible in heart dissections. We have an anterior and a posterior interventricular sulcus. I just circled the anterior here in green. Here's the posterior interventricular sulcus over here also circled in green and these posterior and in excuse me anterior and posterior interventricular sulci are typically going to be uh, filled with major blood vessels 
and a little bit of adipose tissue as well. These sulci will have the coronary arteries, those major blood vessels of the heart. So as we're looking at the interior anatomy of the heart, we have some walls. The walls are referred to as septum. We have the interatrial septum. What is the, where is the interatrial septum? If we just look at the name, inter means in between, in between what? The atria. So the interatrial septum is visible right here in our figure. And then we have the interventricular septum, which is located right here and it separates the two ventric ventricles. And then we have the trabeculae carne. <laughs> it's just, just a fun name to say. I enjoy this name. So as we look at the trabeculae carne, our trabeculae carne are labeled right here in our figure, and they are pointing to these branch-like structures of, or these ridges, or branching kind of structures that are on the inside of the ventricles, and they help to keep the ventricle walls from completely sticking together during contraction. They allow for little pockets of blood to remain in the ventricles so that the ventricles are more likely to open up and expand easily. And then we also have pectinate muscles. These pectinate muscles are going to be uh, little ridges that are on the inside of the atrium. And as we're looking at the inside of the right atrium and our auricles, those pectinate muscles are going to allow for uh, these chambers to help, help them be brought open or maintain their, to keep them from collapsing completely and allows them to open up easier. So in terms of function, pectinate muscles and trabeculae carne are very similar to each other. Um, they're sh ridges. The trabeculae carne are larger ridges, though, that, compared to the pectinate muscles. And another key distinction is that the pectinate muscles are only present within the right atria, at, whereas the trabeculae carne are going to be present in both the left and right ventricles. I know for me, per, in personally, from speaking from personal experience, the lack of the pectinate muscles in the left atria makes it difficult for me when I'm doing a dissection to distinguish, um, okay, here's where the pulmonary vein ends and here's where the atria begins. It's a little bit more difficult. <coughs> We also are going to have valves in our heart. These valves in our heart are have multiple names. I'm going to give you my preferred names. Um, those are the ones that I've made bold, but there are multiple names out there. We use valves to make sure the blood flows one way through the heart. Atrioventricular valves, or AV valves, are going to control blood flow between atria and ventricles. So the AV valve is between an atria and a ventricle, and we have our left and right. The right AV valve has three cusps to it, which is why it's also known as a tricuspid valve. The left AV valve has two large cusps to it. It's known as the bicuspid valve. And to hold these valves in place, we have chordae tendinae. And you can see those chordae tendinae right here in this backlit photograph of a heart. Um, those chordae tendinae are going to connect to the cusps, which are up here, of the muscle, the valves. And to hold the chordae tendinae in place, there's a ridge of muscle tissue, or a, a papilla of muscle tissue, referred to as the papillary muscle. And as we're looking at these valves of the heart, the blood will flow through the right AV valve on the right side of the heart before it flows through the left AV valve on the left side of the heart. So I remember as a student, the rhyme was that you need to try before you buy. Blood goes through the tricuspid before it flows through the bicuspid. Um, but those names tend to, tricuspid and bicuspid tend to be a little bit more difficult for students. Right AV and left AV valves are um, much more descriptive names that are easier for students to wrap their minds around. And we also have semilunar valves, and they're called the semilunar valves because of the cusps having 
a half moon like appearance or a um, a crescent moon appearance. And these semilunar valves are going to control blood flow through the or out into the aorta and into the pulmonary artery. Um, the full names are pulmonary semilunar valves and aortic semilunar valves. Most people will just shorten that up though, myself included, and just say the pulmonary valve and aortic valve because you still know exactly what you're talking about. The valve that controls blood flow into the pulmonary artery and the valve that controls blood flow into the aorta. And the reason the semilunar valves have these large cusps that look like half moons or um, crescent moons is that these cusps need to catch the blood that's flowing backwards. And as these cusps catch the blood that is flowing backwards, they slam shut and prevent blood from flowing the wrong direction. That's all we have for our recording on heart anatomy. If you have any questions or comments, please feel free to post them in the class discussion board or to send me an email. And as always, happy studies.